Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it looks like we're having a little bit of technical challenge um, on, on our side. So I am going to go ahead and begin and SwissNext San Francisco will step in with audio uh, as they are able. So what I hope is that you are able to see my screen right now of the presentation. And if you can send a message in the chat box, if you have any trouble, that's how we will make today's uh, webinar work. So, um, good afternoon. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Liz Neely. I'm the Executive Director of an organization called The Story Collider. And uh, today I'm going to be speaking with you about how we can help support the faculty and scientists that we work with in um, telling stories about their science and to be effective science communicators. If you are on Twitter, we do have um, a hashtag. It's higher ed ch, and then this is my, my Twitter handle, at Liz Neely. I've also put my email and Twitter handle into the chat so you can contact me. I wanted to begin by giving you a sense of what the Story Collider does so you can understand the perspectives that I bring. So we produce live storytelling shows featuring scientists and researchers. They have 10 minutes to tell a true, very personal story live on stage in front of audiences. We have shows in London, New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles. And we also travel around the country to host these. We also will present um, a podcast every week where we have produced these true personal stories. This is what our website looks like. And I have a very brief audio clip I hope you can hear to give an example of the ways that these scientists' voices sound in our work. I hopped off the train, ran as fast as I could, barged into my office door and without even saying hello to my lab mates, picked up the phone and dialed into the conference line. Hello? So there's these true personal stories that we present sometimes have to do with the moment of discovery of a research finding. Sometimes they have to do with the worst day someone has ever experienced while they were out in the field doing their research. But one of the things I know over the past decade of doing trainings for researchers is that the process in which we are trained in science makes it difficult for many um, scientists to tell these personal stories on stage or in more formal settings. And I know this because I'm a marine biologist, I'm a scientist by training myself. Um, so I studied, this is my team, um, I'm here in the upper left-hand corner. Um, I studied the evolution of color patterns and visual systems in tropical reef fish. I was very interested in their eyes and their color patterns. And so here's an example of the kind of fish I worked on in beautiful coral reef settings. But the way that I talked about this and the way that I thought about it looked more like this, which um, is probably familiar to those of you who have worked with evolutionary biologists. And I understood conceptually as I was doing my PhD that talking about my work with other people was important. And so I worked hard to develop that 30 second elevator speech we talk about. And I would actually say, and I laugh now, but I would say, oh, I study the synonymous to non-synonymous substitution ratios in transmembrane regions of rhodopsins and rases to my taxi driver or someone like that. Uh, and that clearly is not actually telling the story of the kind of work that I did. So my life changed and I started becoming interested in science communication when um, a journalist named Susan Milius wrote up my research in Science News. It was a long story. She got it absolutely right, and in the end, the last three paragraphs of the story, she talked about my work and she said that I studied visual pollution. 
And so for me, that single phrase and reading her paragraphs about my work that were accurate to the research I was doing, but also helped people understand why it mattered and connected to things that made sense in their life rather than this transmembrane region, blah, 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 set me down this new career path. So I worked um, on coral reefs as my focus system, helping to tell those stories to journalists and to policymakers. I worked in Fiji and Papua New Guinea, and I also worked on deep sea corals um, that were being traded in for jewelry and, and design. So we had a high-end fashion campaign. So we had Tiffany & Co. as our major partner on this. We worked with designers. And I, I built a policy project around this, trying to build monitoring in the international trade. And so through that work, I found myself giving testimony in policy settings, like here I am at the 14th meeting of the Conference of Parties that uh, regulate international trade in endangered species, acting as a scientific expert. And here, I still, I had gotten better about talking about the work in non-technical terms, but I still found myself very surprised that the people telling stories about the individuals who worked in creating the jewelry from these corals got more traction than I did with all my facts and figures about how slow they are to grow and how heavily they're fished. And so I, I used that learning experience to continue trying to help researchers talk to journalists and to policymakers. So for the past 10 years before I joined the Story Collider, I worked with a group called Compass helping senior faculty members figure out how to tell stories about their work. I'm the co-author of a book and have written reports on these things. And so um, what I have found in that time is that many scientists want to engage. They're even looking for your help in doing this, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's easy on either party. So when Swiss Next reached out to me, to ask me to share my advice um, on how you, uh, the members of this webinar, can learn from the Story Collider and my past 10 years of work. I was asked to talk about how we can empower our faculty, the scientists we work with, to tell good stories, tell great stories, and to become strong science communicators. So that's how I'm going to structure my remarks for the rest of um, this presentation. And I will stop in between the sections to ask if you have any questions so that I'm not um, just charging ahead too rapidly. So first is the question of how do we motivate faculty? Because I'm sure that if your experience is similar to mine, we find a large range of willingness to use these tools and also a large, um, variation in how much time researchers are willing to put in um, to practice and to change their, you know, traditional ways of communicating. One of the things I like to begin with is finding out what my audience needs, so what each specific researcher I'm working with has in their head as their goal of why they're trying to do this at all. What you see on screen is data from a new study that will be coming out shortly asking a large sample of scientists in the U.S., which I apologize for, but this is where my expertise is, um, what their goal is when they attempt to communicate science. So you, think, you see things like to educate people, to defend science from misinterpretation or attack, uh, to excite people about how wonderful the world is and give them a sense of awe, to build trust so that people are willing to take the advice of the scientific community on topics ranging from climate change to vaccinations, and then lastly, to tailor messages so that our communications are well targeted and suited to the audience as we intend to um, reach. In this survey, uh, what we found was that scientists most strongly identified a goal of defending knowledge in the U.S., defending science in the U.S., and educating people as their top aims, 
with the others going down from there. Depending on what that goal is, if we tailor the advice we're giving to them to the outcome they want to see, and they feel like they are both supported and they understand the return on their investment, this is where I've found the greatest amount of success in asking scientists to try mechanisms like storytelling as a new tool in their toolkit. For in the U.S., one of the big questions that I get over and over again is about credibility. And why should scientists have to tell stories? Why isn't it enough that they have earned these degrees, they've done all these years of research, people should just trust them, they should have credibility. And what I have started to do in building my own credibility among my research audience is to look to the scientific literature about communication as a way to connect to them. And one of the things that I've discovered that's very useful to talk about with scientists is that credibility is not something you only earn by yourself, depending on which university you're employed by and what journals you publish in. But in the eyes of your audience, credibility is a, co a combination of this idea of competence, like how skilled are you, of goodwill, which means what are your intentions? You know, do you hope for the best for the people you're trying to serve or to educate? and then trustworthiness. Do they like you? Do they believe that you have their best interests at heart? And so some of the research that I present to them as I'm helping scientists wrap their head around why we tell stories instead of just presenting the data very clearly, I look to Susan Fisk, who is a psychologist at Princeton University. And she has a whole series of papers over the past 30 years looking at many different disciplines about how we gain this trust and credibility. And what they have found is that for audiences, whenever any human being is looking at another human being and trying to determine if they trust them, there are two elements that we look for. The first is called warmth. And the second is called competence. And you can look at this by mapping out in space the kinds of words that we use to describe other people. And in this chart, if you imagine on our x-axis, so going from left to right, that's warmth. And so warmth means are you friendly? Are you kind? Are you helpful? If you're cold, then you're, you know, unhappy and um, rude, boring, things like that. Uh, the important thing here is that most scientists don't like those kinds of words because they're very much more interested in this Y axis, right? So from top to bottom on the chart, being very competent or intelligent, you're intellectual, you're skillful, you're serious. Um, the opposite of that is on the bottom end right here, right? You're foolish or clumsy or stupid. And because in science we are so used to thinking about competence, where's your data? How do you know this? Did you run the right statistical tests? We think that that's everything that matters. But the truth is human beings, when they're assessing a stranger, judge warmth much more rapidly it has a stronger overall influence on how we perceive someone, like whether we want to listen, pay attention to, or follow the directions of someone. And it really strongly influences these qualities of credibility and trustworthiness. What's the most interesting is when you transform this graph, so I'll put new labels on it, right? So competent at the top and then warm over on the side. Among both American and European audiences, you can ask about their opinions and stereotypes of different professions and groups of people and how that maps onto this map. So if you are both warm and competent, you're admired. If you're warm but incompetent, people have sympathy for you. If you're incompetent and cold, this is where people feel contempt. And then there's this interesting quadrant of cold but competent, 
This is where many scientists and engineers as professionals fall into this space. It's a confusing sort of ambiguous emotional space for people. They feel envy because they aspire to some of the qualities that are there. But it, envy is actually a negative emotion in many instances. And there have been several very interesting studies showing that people will inadvertently smile when they hear a story of something bad happening to someone in that envied, cold, but competent quadrant. So there's schadenfreude. And so what we want to do is help scientists move out of that space where they're perceived to be arrogant or cold and into this warmer space where they're admired and trusted. Another body of research that I like to pull into play here is that this insight that I've just presented to you isn't novel. We have known this and we know a lot of the basic elements of communication, as I'm sure many of you on this call know. Um, and we give the same advice over and over and over again. So when people ask me what is the one single study I suggest that they read about science communication or risk perception, this is the one I point to. So Baruch Fischoff in 1994 wrote a paper called 20 Years of Process in Risk Perception and Communication. And even though this is now more than 20 years old, the process of reinventing the wheel continues to be true. So every time an individual scientist, or an institution, or an agency discovers they need to communicate risk to a different kind of public, they go through the same process. They think first, well, we just have to have the right data. You know, we, it's all the technical side of things. Oh, well, once we have that, then we just have to tell them the numbers. Oh, no, wait. We have to explain the numbers. That makes sense. Wait, we have to explain the numbers and explain to our audience that they accept similar risks in other parts of their life, or they've accepted this or greater risks in the past. Okay, that doesn't work. We have to show them that this is fair. We have to be nice to them. We have to make them partners. And, you know, so it goes over and over again. People go through this learning curve of misunderstanding at first. They think the data is all that matters. And then over time, in many instances, through difficult personal experiences, they learn um, that it requires warmth. It requires personality. It requires storytelling. It requires listening. And so I wanted to close out this section by sharing a personal story for me of an example in which I've worked with a scientist through this same process to sort of illustrate where we began and how we used storytelling to come to a successful outcome. And just as a reminder for those of you who joined late, our Swiss Next host had some audio problems early. <laughs> um, please do send questions through the chat and we are going to be pausing after each section to take additional questions if you have them. So here's my case study and my personal story of the most recent research paper I worked on while I was still at Compass. This is Dr. Jenna Jambeck. She's an engineer at, at University of Georgia, and she studies plastic waste in the oceans. Almost exactly a year ago now, she had a very high profile paper in Nature coming out. And I had been enlisted to help her on the media side of the promotion of, of this. So this is prior to embargo lifting. So I read the paper and I called her and I said, Dr. Jambeck, I'm really excited to be working with you. Can you tell me in your own words, what do you think the most important point of this paper is? And there was dead silence on the line. And then she said very uncomfortably, well, I think you should read the paper and then speak to me about my work, <laughs> which is unfortunately common for scientists. And I said, oh, yes, I have read it carefully, repeatedly. I'm asking you for your own version in your own words. And still she wanted to walk me through paragraph by paragraph she said, well, why don't I just point you to the relevant sections? And so she did, and this is what they looked like. First, 
Global plastic rosin reached this many million tons in 2012, a 600 whatever percent increase since 1975. Okay. Then she started talking about what percentage of the municipal solid waste plastics made up in 1960 and how that compared to 2005, and then giving me an, an idea of which countries had this data available. Then she started getting to their results that they estimated 2.5 billion metric tons of municipal solid waste by all these people, 6.4 billion people in 192 countries, um, and how many million metric tons of the waste were plastic. And then finally, um, additional information about plastic waste generation, how much of it was classified as mismanaged, um, and how much of that was entering the ocean. So she was functionally walking me through step by step the model that they had produced to come up with their answers. But nowhere in the paper or in what she was telling me did she ever answer this central question. How much plastic entered the ocean in 2010? Which is the first question that the journalists who were going to be interviewing her would need to understand. And it's the first question that her public audience would have. How big is this problem? So we worked using a tool that Compass generate called the message box. And the most important thing that I helped her understand, and I'm sure you've all gone through this process your own ways many times, is that your audience, especially when they are not experts in your field, can only keep a certain number of facts and figures and pieces of information in their mind at one time you need to have a takeaway message. And in those four paragraphs that she pointed out to me and said, well, this is the overall point, there are actually highlighted in yellow here 26 different pieces of information she was asking people to remember. So we started working on this problem with the idea that her audience was going to be outlets like the New York Times or the BBC. And the problem was plastic pollution in the ocean. So I'm going to just fill the screen now with the text so you can see it. But overall, what she was saying is, we do not know how much plastic is currently in the oceans, nor where the sources are. Plastic is not only unsightly, it's dangerous to marine animals, to ocean animals. They choke on it, they get tangled, they die. We also think that it has health impacts with the way that it breaks down and starts to chemically interfere with reproductive hormones. The solution is that we know we cannot simply remove trash from the ocean in easy ways, especially these tiny particles. So we need to stop the flow. In order to stop the plastic going into the ocean, we need to understand where it's coming from. So this paper was the first ever to track annual input by country so that we can start to institute systems to prevent things from entering the ocean in the first place. So this is the messaging step. From there, we needed to make sure she had that bottom line. We estimate that people added 8.8 .8 million metric tons of plastic into the ocean in 2010. Then she translated that to a number that people could start to visualize saying, it's five grocery bags of trash going into the ocean along every foot of coastline in the world. And then they ran the numbers against FAO fisheries data, and they would say, we're taking out tuna and we're putting in plastic because the gross total weights on those two numbers were the same. Because they really started to give these numbers meaning, and then also talk about, does that number scare them? Many journalists ask them, how do you feel hopeful? Do you feel overwhelmed? You have children, what do you make of this? It helps them design their preparation for interviews. It helps them design the infographics that went along with the work that were widely distributed to news organizations. You may have even seen some of this coverage. And the story went everywhere. BBC, New York Times, Washington Post, 
all of the biggest news outlets in the world covered this story. And the most important thing was they got the numbers right. They told the story of what the research found. What they also told was the story of how Dr. Jambeck met her husband for the first time at a garbage dump while they were looking at banana peels in old newspapers. They also told the story of the round the world research crews that they had participated in and what it was like to live on those boats. And so the scientists here were extremely happy with the global news coverage of their paper, but they understood that it came about for many more reasons than saying, you should read my research paper. The most important thing for these scientists who were authors on this paper too, is that because of the coverage that they got in the press, we saw political action happening here in the United States, um, as well as Prince Charles's um, Global Oceans Initiative, where people started to use the research to support bans on plastic bags, for example, or um, in attempting to reduce marine debris. And you know that you've gotten um, really your message across when political cartoons or satire sites start to highlight your research, which is what happened here, where they were making a joke about sorting our trash into different oceans the same way that we sort our, our recycling. But what this tells you is that the story was big enough and had enough traction that people were paying attention to it across all levels of culture. The reason that I spent you know, 10 minutes of our webinar sharing this example with you is because it was not only helping the scientists through this process, but then turning around and using this exact same case study with other researchers that has made them willing to embrace the idea of doing a little bit more storytelling, of being more personal, and of taking, accepting the advice of press officers about how they can translate their research into the kinds of information and ideas that get picked up in the press. And so just to close this section out, and then I'll pause if we have any questions. What I tell them is that the best available science and all of our great case studies show that narrative communication, so storytelling, is encoded using a unique cognitive pathway. It means people think about stories, they listen to them differently. And a great body of literature suggests that stories are more interesting. They're more likely to generate interest and engagement on a topic than other forms of information. They're more understandable and they improve comprehension of the details or the content that you're trying to convey. They're more believable. So people's real world beliefs, they're more likely to be persuaded by stories than by explanatory texts or other kinds of argumentation. So that brings me to the end of this section about motivating our faculty. And before I start talking about the advice we give on how to tell great stories. I'm going to pause and look at the um, chat and also um, invite Julia to, to speak up if we have any questions. Okay. Um, I will continue talking, and if any come up, please feel free to speak. And I'll oh, say about our audio problems. All right, so section two is about how do we empower scientists to really tell great stories. So one of the things that is a pet peeve of mine, and I think turns research-minded people off of the arts, are some of these myths about left brain versus right brain. You often will see an image like this in presentations and we say, well, using one side of your brain, this is where you do all your math and your calculations and your, you know, you're very formal. And the other side of your brain, this is artistic and fun and colorful and wonderful. The neuroscience does not support this idea at all. 
but there is very interesting neuroscience about storytelling that I think we should pay attention to. So I have these citations in the presentation. I will share these slides with you and give you a bibliography if you are curious about the research I'm presenting today. But this first one um, I think is cool because when you're in an audience and you're looking at slides with bullet point text, your brains are active, but the portions of your brains that are functioning are largely the ones that process language and then that link it to meaning. But it really sort of stops there. However, when I'm, list when I'm telling you a story, talking about the coral reefs that I studied on and the way the, white, the, the water felt on my skin, or Jenna Jambeck standing on that garbage dump and the way it smelled, um, we're starting to activate the parts of our brains that are more sensory, and that would be active if you were actually experiencing and participating in the events of the story. We also know that that is true whether we're using sensory language, like I mentioned, or metaphors that are sort of emotionally charged or trigger some of those same sensations. So we're engaging more parts of the brain. What we also know is that there's a fascinating phenomena called speaker-listener neural uh, coupling. And this means that it's like being in sync with a really good storyteller. As you listen to someone who's sharing something personal and powerful, your brain starts to synchronize and light up in similar ways that the storyteller is. And so you can actually see in different bits of the brain that when we talk about that feeling of engagement or that sense of being swept away by a story, this is what we're actually seeing in terms of our neurobiology. I've also seen some really fascinating studies showing that because people are a visual species, we tend to keep our eyes wide open during moments of tension or when we're nervous or waiting to, you know, for something to happen. And we blink when we're, you know, when it's likely to be safe, <laughs> when we're likely not to miss too much information. So they're fascinating research when an audience in front of a masterful storyteller, their blinking rates will actually start to synchronize. So I tell this to scientists and say, look, Here's what stories do to our brains. So what is a story? There are many, many different ways of describing this kind of packaging. One of the most basic that goes all the way back to Aristotle and everyone who consumes any sort of popular culture, movies, television, is familiar with the three-act structure. And so this might seem familiar to you. Act one, is the setup. It's where we're introduced to our characters, and then something happens, a dynamic incident of some sort that's a catalyst. It changes things. And then in Act 1, you get rising action until some sort of turning point. Act 2 is called confrontation, and usually what happens here is that your hero, the central character in the story, does not yet have the tools or knowledge that they need and things get worse, right? It starts, the tension starts to pile up. They get nervous or they assemble their team of, you know, people who are going to help them. And then finally, in the act three, we have the resolution. And so this is where the greatest tension and stakes are. And that is the arc of the story. So the most important thing for scientists to understand is that stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They have characters who are people who experience some sort of challenge or conflict, and that there's some sort of resolution or progress over the course of the structure. Now, my audience as scientists in the U.S., they let, you know, they understand this. It's not that they don't get it, but they don't think it's for them. And one of the biggest problems we run into is, again, that distinction between facts and feelings. They think, I don't want this story to be about me. 
I want it to be about what I found. And so what we have done is started to help them understand that people do not connect to abstract ideas very well. You know, most people who are not scientists, that's not the way they think. But there, we are all very curious about other people. So if you can share your feelings, this is a bridge that you're building to allow your audience to follow you. And in fact, lately I've been using a Pixar movie, it's a children's movie called Inside Out, it's about emotions, as a way to help name some of the core feelings that they may have experienced over the course of a research project or over the course of their career that they can tap into as the basis for a story, whether it's anger or frustration, um, joys, excitement, um, disgust, fear, sadness, helping them understand that not only are these emotions valid to experience themselves, but that judiciously tapping into them and sharing them that is in a way authentic to themselves and appropriate to the science that they are trying to get across will really help them tell, talk about their research in a way that is memorable. And so what I explain to them is, if what you as a scientist want to discuss is the substance, the content, like the research findings, that's the gray box down on the, on the bottom, you need to build a ladder and understand that the first most important thing is to spark interest and then to tell people why this is important. If you can do those things, then you can have them follow you as deeply as you wish into the substance, the content of your research. This tool that I use to help scientists begin their brainstorming process is a mind map. So on your screen here, you'll see it's sort of this nonlinear structure. And sometimes I will have them put facts in those red idea um, circles and then build out from there. And then sometimes I have them put those feelings, you know, fear or anger or joy and have them build out that way. Then we coach them through the process of telling a story. A very, very simple structure, and I, I almost laugh, I feel embarrassed to introduce this to you. You're all professionals in communication, but one of the ones that we have found works well is the story spine. So, once upon a time and every day, right? So I set up, but then one day, there's some sort of inciting action, that catalyst that changes things. Because of that, then you have this turning point, right? You're going through act two now. Because of that, things cascade until finally we reach our climax. And ever since then, this is the way the world is. Um, this feels faintly ridiculous sometimes for some researchers. And, you know, it is, like, this, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit every, every circumstance. But it is not a bad way to begin that progression of helping people understand beginning, middle, end, characters, causation, emotional stakes. And so the questions I most often get is, where do I begin and how do I end a story? The answer that we give to that is begin in the action. Don't do a whole long setup, just instead of saying, today I'm going to tell you the story of how I became interested in this kind of protein, it's much more interesting to say, you know, there I was in mud up to my knees as the sun set. We often will have a lot of discussions about how much science to include. This is where we emphasize the importance of picking the battle, highlighting the things that matter the most, remembering that you have a limited attention span and a limited ability for people to keep all those different numbers in their heads. We talk about the difference between precision versus accuracy. We always seek to maintain accuracy, but that when we're talking to outside audiences, we give up some of those details that don't matter as much. So the checklist that the Story Collider uses as we're developing stories with researchers looks like this. Does it have a likable character going through some sort of struggle that makes us care? Are there clear stakes involved of what happens if we don't understand this process? What, what does it mean that we don't know how much 
plastic is in the ocean. Okay, I will go back to that slide and pause again. I think we still have no audio on the Swiss next end. Um, are Maybe there any other questions? Can, hang on a second. Maybe. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Wow. Yes. Amazing. <laughs> it's nice to have my voice back. Um, great. Sorry, I couldn't introduce you, Liz, but thank you for starting everything without having me introducing you and letting everyone know that they can ask questions through the chat. So I don't see a question mm -hmm. right now, but uh, we have a huge group and I feel like they're all listening and they can't wait for the next section. So I think you can just dive in into the next one. So and I will mute myself again and hope that next time I can talk again when you have room okay. for questions. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have um, just about 15 minutes left before the end of the section. And I did the least amount of slides in preparation for this final bit about how to coach our scientists to communicate science because it is such a big question. And I feel like there are so many resources, other resources out there, other webinars that SwissNext will be hosting. So I wanted to point you to a few things that have influenced me and then give you some overarching advice. So you've heard me discussing Compass. We have this book, Escape from the Ivory Tower, that outlines exactly what we do. And that tool I showed you, the message box, is available on their website for free to download. There's many, many popular books. One in the US that has just come out this year and is very heavily focused on storytelling and provides a tool that I think is quite useful. It's called Houston, We Have a Narrative by Randy Olson, who also wrote Don't Be Such a Scientist. I think his big moment of insight is that most researchers, when they are untrained and go to talk to a public audience or journalist, string together lots of facts. They'll say this and that and this other thing and this and also take into consideration that, and um, you just use the word and to string together all these facts. And he helps scientists to learn that sense of the arc, that the tension, the, the structure and struggle that a scientist, that a character goes through using and, but, and therefore. And so it would be something like, um, a personal story for me is I love Christmas. It's my favorite time of year. And I had never had a real Christmas tree before in last year, and I was so excited. But I never expected the tree to send me to the emergency room. And it, you can see from just something like that, that structure, that suddenly everyone is curious, like, why would a Christmas tree send someone to the emergency room? What? You know, um, and I can talk about the injury that I received and the importance of proper Christmas tree assembly, you know, um, that way. The challenge is when you go to a webinar like this or you speak to anyone, and I'm sure you experience this yourselves, when people say, what should I read? What other resources are out there? The answer is, dozens and dozens and dozens of books. We could spend the rest of our careers doing nothing except reading to try and come up to speed on everything that could be recommended. What I hope is that through the webinars that you're going to, through your professional networks, the blogs you're reading, the papers you're writing, we can start to ask better questions. And so it might be, how do we coach scientists to get them to use story? What do we know about the neuroscience of storytelling? So the kinds of things you've seen me developing in my presentation. The major fields of research that I think come to bear on this question of how do we communicate science effectively include things like risk communication, risk perception, and psychology. Um, if you are working in those disciplines, understanding the ways in which people search for information about something that scares them, the way that they collect 
information, make sense of that, who they, who they look to for advice, and how we can help slot our scientists into those processes, that's a really rich area and I can give you specific advice there. I can also talk about things like in the U.S., um, political identity is becoming very wrapped up in how people see some scientific issues and understanding when that is the case how we disentangle that question of identity and your political affiliation from whether or not you believe in climate change. That's a big field of inquiry and study that I can talk about. But um, I think the challenge is there's no such thing as just like the definitive book on science communication. And as professionals, we all know this, right? It's each scientist who comes to us has a specific field of research they're working in that might have relevant work that we can use to help them. And then they themselves are coming to the table with different misperceptions or fear of journalists or willingness to talk to the public, willingness to be vulnerable, skills, strengths, and weaknesses that they bring. And so I think it's a balancing act because we're always trying to support these researchers but also challenge them, to give them tools that they will use, to ask them to do things in a different way than they've been trained to sort of naturally would tend to do things without trying to force them into ways of performing that don't feel real or that are too heavily coached. So for us at the Story Collider, our bottom line is it's your story. We want you to start where you are. And sometimes that means the research isn't done yet, but it doesn't mean that people aren't interested in hearing what we've done so far. We want our scientists to use what they have, so to play to their strengths. If they have beautiful pictures, great, let's use pictures. If they are really funny, wonderful, let's let them be funny. If they're not funny, please, we will not try <laughs> to do that and then do what you can. So like I started to say, it's your story. Tell it well and let us help you. So that brings me to the end of my presentation for today. And we have a little, about five minutes, I think, before we come to the end of the hour. So I hope that maybe you might have some questions um, or recommendations, especially on this question of what books have you read or what resources do you recommend to each other that you might share in, in the chat? Thank you so much, Liz. Um, I hope my audio is still here. Um, my yes. colleague says yes. Um, thank yes. you so much. I don't see a question right now through the chat. Um, I think this was really fascinating, a lot of takeaways for them. I would like to hear if anyone maybe has experience um, working with scientists and maybe the main challenge that you're facing you can also tell us through the chat. And um, um, I think, I'm not sure if I missed it when I was trying to find my audio, but I think you, did you mention that you have podcasts on your on your website? I do, yes. So if you're interested, um, storycollider.org is our website. You can also just search iTunes or SoundCloud, whatever app you use to get podcasts for the Story Collider. And there's one episode per week. That's great. I think it's very useful if you listen to them and kind of see um, how these people tell their stories. And it might give you some ideas for, for next time when you have to work on something. Um, so I don't see anything coming through. Um, I want to thank you so much, Liz. This was very fascinating. And I think you promised us your slides. And we also recorded this. So for any one of you who wants to share this with a colleague, um, I will put these on our website later. Or you can email me, and I'll send you the recording. So thank you so much, Liz. Oh, you know what? Yeah, I, yeah, we did get one final question that I will answer briefly, and then we can continue. So the Great. question is, have I ever experienced that stories themselves can reduce credibility in the eyes of researchers? And the answer to that is yes. Um, you know, this, this is what makes the work so difficult, is stories by their very nature are anecdotal. 
It means that it is a specific instance and you cannot generalize from them. And I also think that in my experience coming up trained as a PhD scientist and working with them for the past 12 years, we often use the word storytelling to mean hand-waving, that when the data is not really strong, instead you make an emotional appeal or something that sounds good or sounds, you know, plausible. And so done poorly, yes, absolutely, I think scientists are looking for that evidence and they are looking for reason to believe what they are being told. And so that's why I do, that's why I'm so careful to do the work of showing them when I walk in, look, I've read these papers, I've done my research, I can talk to you about the statistics and the sample sizes and the approaches and the shortcomings, like of those fMRI studies that I showed you. And I explained that this is, a, they are taking a risk, but then go to making the whole case that you've heard me give in this webinar today about why it's worthwhile. What I do find sometimes, um, Nicole asked this question, is that it comes down to a philosophical difference that many researchers, because they have spent their entire careers trying to remove that sort of subjective human experience from it, think that only the data tells the truth and that using emotion is actually unethical, which is a very interesting question that I've had come up. And in those arguments, what I say is it comes down to you have to be able to sleep at night. You have to be able to believe that you are doing the best service and the best work that you can to share the knowledge we have. For me, I cannot ignore the weight of evidence that suggests that stories are engaging, effective tools. If I care about people and I want them to understand the work that I'm doing, I believe we need to use stories. That, you know, when I make that case, I am relying on the scientist's perception of my own credibility. And so I arm myself the way that I described as much as I can with facts and, and data. And I also tell them there are times and places to tell stories. And it's not always the way we do it. But instead of saying, I tell a story to get somebody to believe a fact, I think, no, tell a story to help somebody understand the process of science. And that's where we find the most success. Okay. Perfect. Um, I, I think that was question. a great end. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, one more question that just came in for anyone who needs to go. Thank you very much. Please go ahead and hang up. <laughs> but, um, yeah, this, this question is how to handle stories deriving from artistic research, which is more experimental, so not that fact-based, to cultural skepticism and the technocrats, which you have the impression is the other way around. Um, and yes, so I'm not sure I have an answer to this. I'm not actually sure what the question is, but I acknowledge this is a problem. And some of the other ways that I approach this discussion is I present research about science communication. There's something called the deficit model, which is the underlying assumption that people either are, they don't care about your, your work or they resist it because they just don't have the facts. And so all we have to do is provide them with facts. But the research shows people, and we all know this, people are not empty vessels waiting to be filled up with information. They have an existing worldview and lenses through which they view new evidence that they're slotting into. And the technical jargon around this is we've got cognitive biases, we've got heuristics, which are sort of mental shortcuts. And um, what I help people understand is that there are lots of ways of gaining knowledge about the world. And the most important thing that we know is that if you want people to believe you and listen to you, you have to make them feel like you care about them, going back to that whole trust, credibility, and goodwill. And that means explaining how you know something and also acknowledging the shortcomings of it. So taking into account that there may be artistic ways of having conversations or these other things to help. So. 
Great. Any more questions that you see? I think they sent it to you privately, probably. I don't see any other question in my chat. Um, I think that's it. Okay, great. Well, it's 7.58 in San Francisco. It's almost 5 in Switzerland, and I guess it's about 11 for you, 11 a.m. That's right. So mm -hmm. thanks again, and thanks everyone for joining. I can only encourage you to go to the storycollider.org to check out these, po these podcasts and any other resources that they have for you. And um, stay tuned for our next webinar when we send our next update, and enjoy the evening. Yeah, Bye, thank everyone. you also very much. Bye, Liz. Take thank care. you again. Bye. Bye-bye.